You mentioned the word BMW. Now, to most people, you might think of a sleek luxury car or a boy racer power sliding around a corner or sometimes a driver that forgets his indicators. However, most people think of a car. They don't think of something of an engine of 1,800 horsepower powering one of the deadliest fighters of the Second World War, the Focke Wolf 190. Our story today starts with not the Fort Wolf 190, but the aeroplane behind me, the Messerschmitt 109. This is an E model that would have been around in the Battle of Britain. And the first three high scoring aces of all time all flew the 109. The fourth and the fifth high scoring aces of all time flew the Fort Wolf 190. With the huge development going on for the German ministry in the wartime, the Messerschmitt 109 mass produced Daimler Benz engines in the 109 were pretty well subscribed. The German ministry wanted another fighter for the Luftwaffe to fight alongside the 109. The gentleman designing it, a fantastic aeronautical engineer called Kurt Tank. Bit of a hero in National Socialist Germany, fantastic aeronautical engineer and test pilot himself. Kurt Tank worked for Messerschmitt a short time on his own, but then his uh, genius was revealed and went on to design what became the Fort Wolf 190. Kurt Tank's design of the Fort Wolf 190, very different from Willie Messerschmitt's 109. A 109 sleek, aerodynamic. A Fort Wolf is hunched like a pit bull. Very strong in design, tapered wing edges. It could roll very fast. It could take a lot of punishment. And the performance was electrifying. Well, the 190, it was a beautiful aircraft to handle, magnificent to fly and manoeuvre. It was very fast for a piston-engine aircraft, and it had nice characteristics even to fly in bad weather. In a traditional engine like the V12 Rolls-Royce Merlin, or the inverted Daimler Benz, also a V12 but inverted, the pistons go up and down. Up and down in a V, hence the V12. A radial is different, obviously, because the cylinders and the cylinder heads are splayed out like half a corn cob, if you will, with a crank in the middle. With it not being a inline engine, it's got a larger frontal area, not as aerodynamic, but very rugged indeed and can take quite a bit of punishment. As brilliant as a designer as Kurt Tank was, of course, all new design aeroplanes are gonna have problems, and a Fort Wolf wasn't without them. The cooling of this huge, powerful engine was a problem. Basically, some of the pilots enjoyed it because they like to keep the feet very warm but it wasn't very good for the engine. Initially cowlings to try and get more air into the fins of the cylinders and the cylinder heads, but then ideas of fans came on board. First a 10 bladed fan and then later on with 12, therefore aiding the cooling of the huge powerful radial. Kurt Tank did a lot of testing himself. In fact, in one of the pre-production models nearly killed himself in an inverted spin. But of course, being a brilliant pilot he was, he got out of it. The Fockwell's problems were eventually ironed out Late 41, early 42, appearing in squadron service. Very well made at the Fort Wolf factory and the pilots loved them. A Fort Wolf was rugged with a big wide track. Yes, quite difficult to land because of the torque and the power of it. But eventually, with the modern things like electrical undercarriage, a roll rate that was previously just about unknown, a huge amount of power, the Fort Wolf was very, very much liked by its Luftwaffe pilots. When the Fort Wolf became successful, a lot of the aces stuck with the old tried and tested Messerschmitt 109s. But pilots like Otto Kittel and Walter Novotny changed to the Fort Wolf. Another famous exponent of the Fort Wolf 190, Joseph Pips Priller. Priller, unfortunately, having the famous distinction of shooting down over 60 Spitfires with his Fort Wolf. The National Socialists, of course, were very proud of the design of their aeroplanes. And Priller actually posed with his BMW sports car with his Fort Wolf in the background just for a nice little promotion picture for the National Socialists and for BMW. The Fort Wolf 190 first entered service in late 1941, first flying on the Western Front against the Royal Air Force. When the famous ace Johnny Johnson returned from his aerial battle, first encountering the Fort Wolf 190, 
He was amazed at the performance of the new rugged aeroplane that no one had seen before. And he got back and presented his reports to his officers and exclaimed how deadly these aeroplanes were that had just had him and his Spitfire pilots for breakfast. I had seen one in late 1941 and I had reported it as a new type of aircraft with square wing tips and a radial engine and I even drew a sketch of it and somebody at the Air Ministry came back and told us that it was some French airplanes which the Germans had refurbished. So the, the, the Focke-Wulf 190 took our intelligence services completely by surprise. In 1941, the contemporary Spitfire was a Mark V. A Spitfire Mark V was in trouble against the Focke Wolf 190. A Focke Wolf could outclimb it, outroll it, initially outdive it, but it couldn't outturn it. A Mark V Spitfire could just outturn the Focke Wolf and from a very, very high altitude eventually outdive it. But in an initial dogfight, it was outclassed in most respects. So to try and help the Mark V Spitfire, to try and help it roll quicker. They clip the ends off the wings. Looks like it's got a couple of metal snippers and gone clip, clip, but it hasn't. It's just left the elliptical end off the wing. So the surface area of the wing is not there. It can't turn as tight as it would have done, but in an initial dogfight, it could roll out the way quicker. Also to help it, they clipped and cropped the wheels and fans in the supercharger to make it spin up quicker. But the Fock Wolf still held the advantage. It wasn't until the introduction of the Spitfire Mark 9, with its two-speed, two-stage supercharged Merlin engine, nearly 1,700 horsepower, to redress the balance against the Fock Wolf. When the British government realised that the Fock Wolf 190 was not one of the P-36s left behind, and something to be highly regarded and fearful of, Ball started rolling even for a commando unit idea to go and steal one with a pilot. But then, as it happened, we didn't really need to. A pilot called Armin Faber got lost in some bad weather over the Bristol Channel. He'd actually just had a dogfight with a Spitfire and unfortunately shot it down. He hadn't got many hours in a Fock Wolf, and he wasn't the most experienced Fock Wolf pilot. He landed at an airfield that happened to be in southern Wales. The Fock Wolf was gestured by some RAF groundman into a pen, a quick-thinking sergeant got hold of his very pistol, jumped onto his wing, pointed it at the pilot's head, and then he realised what had happened. He was taken captive, and Faber actually tried unsuccessfully to commit suicide. Now we had a Fock Wolf in captivity. It had to be tested and evaluated through hours and hours of painstaking testing. The impact of having a Fock Wolf in captivity can be seen in later years on the development of the Hawker Tempest and the Hawker Sea Fury. The war on the Western Front, the air war was one thing. On the Eastern Front, it was a whole different ball game. We have 22 miles of sea. On the Eastern Front, they had a line. I think JG-52, a very famous Luftwaffe squadron, moved 30 to 40 times in the space of two and a half years as the war went good or bad for the Germans or the Russians. Pilots were in a target-rich environment within 15 minutes flying time. All the high scoring aces of all time were all German pilots and mainly all on the Eastern Front. Now, the argument there is that when Germans first went towards the Eastern Front against Stalin, the Russian aeroplanes weren't up to much. Yes, that might be the case. The little Polykarpov biplanes, about the same sort of performance to the British Gladiator long before the war. But with the Russian design bureaus like Lavochkin, Yakovlev, Mikoyan and Gurevich, and Ilushin, with Stalin's gun at the back of the designer's head, they were working 24-7 to get something to beat the Nazi war machine. In a modern day Formula One car, drivers of course have to be superbly fit to suffer modern day lateral G-forces that a Formula One car can produce. Back in the wartime, a Fock Wolf was at the pinnacle of piston engine technology. And basically the pilots had to be fitter than modern Formula One drivers to pull the positive of plus seven, plus eight G in a Fock Wolf 190 without the G-suit that modern jet pilots have. Pilots like Kittel and Novotny were at the top of their game with extremely capable and deadly fighters. 
The 109, obviously a tried and tested aeroplane during the wartime, around 30,000 made in E, F, G, and then right at the end of the war, the K model, the three main German aces, it was their favorite aeroplane and their weapon of choice. But again, it had its limitations. I spoke to Gunter Al and he didn't like the leading edge slats that were gravity controlled and came out all of a sudden when you were coming into land. The undercarriage, very splayed, like a giraffe having a drink, if you will. Very difficult to land. A lot damaged and written off. The Fockwolf, however, made in a different factory, very rugged indeed. Very strong electrical undercarriage, very wide. The pilots loved the aeroplane. Notions of which of the Luftwaffe's fighter is the better aeroplane between the 109G, F or K, or the Fockwolf 190A to D, can only be really down to the pilots themselves. Test pilots, some of them will put the Fockwolf way above the 109. But again, when it's an extension of your right arm, you make the best use of the aeroplane you're used to. With the Allies gaining air superiority in the end of the war, the threat against all German munitions factories, in fact, all of Germany, was pretty grave indeed. Instead of attacking the formations of heavy bombers from all angles, with the threat of the escort as well to deal with, German pilots would hurl themselves head on at the stream of heavily armed B-17s. So all needed then at a closing speed of nearly 600 miles an hour, which is over in a second, is a couple of cannon shells in the cockpit of the B-17, and that aeroplane is going down with 10 very brave young Americans on board. 1944-45, the culmination of the Fockwolf design, came in the D model and the TA-152. TA for tank, after his name. The D model, Fockwolf 190, is in Eric Winkles Brown's list of the top 20 best aeroplanes that he ever flew. And bearing in mind he flew more marks than anybody else basically in history, that gentleman ought to know. The Fockwolf 190D could be going up with the Tempest at 440 miles an hour. The TA-152, the very last one, could also operate way above 30,000 feet. Of course, towards the end of the war, the Messerschmitt 262 shocked everyone. A swept wing jet, it was years ahead of anything that the Allies had. However, it was very, very poorly made by slave laborers who may accidentally on purpose, if the foreman isn't watching, leave a rivet out or two and quite a few of them crashed inexplicably. The Fockwolf, even though a step back and a piston-engined aeroplane, in its rugged design, was very well made to the tune of 20,000 Fockwolves serving on just about all fronts in the Second World War. Towards the latter part of the war, 43, 44 and onwards, Luftwaffe pilots were getting rare. Towards 44 and 45 on the Eastern Front, if you're a Luftwaffe fighter pilot, you were either very good or very dead. Pilots were getting sparse, of course, certainly in frontline units. Not much better than Hitler Youth were being sent up in aeroplanes like Fockwolf 190s, a few hours and then getting up in one of the most deadly fighters around. But no matter who was behind the controls, the Allied pilots always had respect for the Fockwolf 190.